Okay, let's begin module three. Um, we're gonna have a, a mostly me lecturing. Um, actually, it'll only be me lecturing. I apologize, I didn't have any uh, good other material because this is such a huge topic. Um, uh, you know, we're gonna spend this module talking about food assistance or food security. Um, it, it has lots of names. The classic would be sort of welfare uh, or low-income assistance programs, but but only really focused on the the food security and nutrition part. Uh, really, where it it interacts as sort of direct agricultural policy, and so that'll be our first topic. Will be uh, food security in the farm bill, and um, I do have. You know, these are just uh, because there's some charts and stuff I want to be talking through over the course of the lectures. Uh, I wanted to be sure you had links to anything that I use. You could go check on those. Um, these are not readings that are assigned to you, and you should not need to look up anything for the quizzes. So I'm not asking you to go find uh, anything that isn't in the lecture uh, from this. So uh, this is a, you know, the last half of this course is survey based, right? It's we cover the the breadth of topics and try to talk about, uh, try to make them all relate to our economic principles and try to think about how we might approach analysis. But this is a um, not a class where we get to dig completely as deep as we would like. We really focus the first part of the semester on the economics um, of agricultural support because that's our primary topic and that's where we can dig into it but in this these other topics conservation and this week on uh, food assistance not so much um, yeah so in terms of agricultural policy and if we think of agricultural policy as being you know everything that impacts agriculture but then you know a sort of centerpiece of ag policy is the farm bill then you know the, the key fact that not enough people understand is that most of the spending that happens in the farm bill is for food stamps or nutrition spending. Um, low income food assistance, we don't actually have food stamps anymore, um, but it's it, the program is actually called SNAP now, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, but uh, the food stamp nomenclature sort of survives because that's what people understand. Um, and so you see here as a projection from 2014 to 2023, 10 year um, estimates that those are going forward from, I think, uh, I think that was in 2015, um, or maybe at the passage of the Farm Bill, yeah, in 2014, expecting to spend almost 80% of Farm Bill funds uh, going to food stamps and nutrition. Fast forward to the 2018 Farm Bill and the 10-year projection has fallen a little bit down to 76.5 percent and um, that is almost entirely due to one thing and that's just economic conditions improving all right so uh, this 80 percent spending is based on an entitlement we've talked about entitlements if you qualify you get the benefit um, as unemployment drops and uh, economic uh, expansion occurs, right? The economy gets bigger and, and incomes grow, then less people qualify, and that is what you see here. So there's very little. Uh, between 2014 and 2018, there was almost no changes in the programs. Um, there would be some people that sort of fell out of the nutrition uh, assistance roles uh, just through sort of improved income and improved situation and a smaller piece uh, through some changes to eligibility but we'll, we'll save that topic uh, for our discussion time at the end of this module um, okay so government USDA I mean one of the the sort of long-run difficulties of food assistance or you know welfare prog programs broadly is what are the objectives? Okay, and so, you know, at a at a fundamental level, uh, subsistence on government support uh, can 
cannot be the objective because it's it's a fairly low standard that the government can provide um, and so there there is this sort of ambition towards things being transitional uh, in programming um, but that is you know that's a dynamic household situation and it's difficult to monitor right uh, people's incomes change over their life cycle people uh, have disruptions in income that are idiosyncratic to them so it becomes very difficult um, but this is also a place where um, you know even though it's not farm policy it is agricultural policy because agricultural scientists uh, specifically nutrition uh, food policy food uh, um, food economists have played the most important role in sort of developing um, the, the sort of schematics that would allow government to to try to understand how to monitor food security, how to examine income and price trends, and then how to go out and collect information to understand program efficacy, right, and um, and where the the gaps are. And so one of the things they've done is this sort of definition of food security, the hierarchy or, or the continuum here. Um, so high food security is basically no problems. Marginal food security is, is a condition where, um, you know, they're, they're, things could get tight, but in general, the, the food part of the budget uh, is never impacted. Low food security is very similar, uh, except families may have to make behavioral choices uh, maybe eating less nutritious uh, uh, or poorer nutrition than they would care to. Um, they may have to make tougher choices inside of the food budget. So when you get to food insecurity, it is about behavioral change um, that, that causes people to not sort of pursue their, their paramount food intake that, from a nutrition standpoint. And then when you get to very low food security, people are actually having disruptions in their intake um, or they're just consuming less uh, because they're, they're lacking in resources. Um, so when you see a food security number quoted, um, in general, and this, this tends to, to hold, about two-thirds, this will be the total food insecurity number, and if it's 15% uh, nationally, uh, you know, states monitor this as well, uh, ag commissioners uh, uh, in states um, or cabinet uh, level uh, for in for states will we'll talk about the food insecurity rate in the in the state um, but this tends to hold up so these these two categories so the it's about one-third of that percentage if it's 15 percent so about five percent nationally end up in this sort of disruption uh, you know eating less than uh, uh, then they like it. The rest are sort of having to manage their food budget uh, and they may be nutritionally uh, disadvantaged or nutritionally um, disrupted, uh, but they were able to sort of keep consuming calories uh, and, and so that lifestyle, uh, you know, and, and health concerns uh, do not, they may be elevated, but, but not to the same degree. Um, if we think about trends in food insecurity, um, so one of the things, if you start to get a good definition, if you work with people to get uh, a survey mechanism, uh, you may not, you may be imperfect in your measurement, you may be imperfect in your definitions, but what is important is if you consistently apply those, you will track the trends. And, you know, the, the trends have held up. And this is a reconciled series from one of those CRS reports uh, that I cited at the beginning. About 20 years looking at the current population survey. Uh, that is a, a survey that goes out uh, annually, but also has probably has monthly components. Um, I just ask people what they're spending money on, what prices are they seeing. It's where we get things like the inflation rate measured. Uh, but they've added uh, these food insecurity questions to try to gather uh, information from people. So if you look at this, you'll see that that about one-third, two-third uh, sort of tracking right here in this green box, so about five 
and fi- 15, this is all food insecurities, 15% of the population. The very low component is about 5 or 6%. 6%, 15, 4%, almost 11. So it's not perfect, one third, two thirds, but uh, they certainly are moving together. And these trend lines, you know, uh, at the end uh, are something I'll talk about in a second. Um, I did want to highlight this green part here because we are going to see towards the end that spending on SNAP, uh, spending on food uh, assistance goes way up uh, during this period and and even into 2013. Uh, so I, just to preview that, uh, starting from this part up to here, you're going to see this big expansion in the program. And it's because of this persistent food insecurity and the policy approach plus the economy is going to be what plays a role in uh, in that downturn. But the Great Recession, the, the sort of 2008 onset, uh, if you talk to some people, uh, you know, it, it, it bleed. It started mid-2008, early 2008, not a lot of awareness till the financial market crash, um, and then moves into 2009. Uh, but it was, it was notable not for just being large, but also uh, difficult to pull out of, right? So, you know, uh, there are certainly people looking back today, and of course we are, we are in some economic turmoil right now and thinking, did we spend enough money in late 2008, 2009 from the government just to, to, to boost out of it? And of course these numbers say that this flat piece uh, indicates that you know, one thing or the other, either you didn't because you, you started the recovery, you delayed the recovery, uh, but it could have been systemic, right? It could have been something about the economy was so flawed it took time uh, to correct it, especially the financial market piece. Um, okay, so anyway, the Great Re- Recession here, you can you can see dramatic jump, 50% increase in um, uh, food insecurity, that food insecurity is going to be reflected in people's income falling uh, and and being able to afford less. Uh, So people are moving from one category, moderate or marginal food security, uh, into food insecure. People are moving from low food security to very low food security. And, um, you know, that that happened. And uh, it was met with policy response. but it takes us a while. It takes us out till 2011, 2012 to start to see these lines descend. And if you look, this is a persistent sort of fact. The recovery is always slower as you move down the income gradient, right? So if you believe that sort of the average food insecure household uh, and the percentage is moving down at this rate, well, for the worst or the most severe category, the most impoverished, um, the recovery is just slower, right? And and uh, there are any number of things um, there. They, they are less likely to participate in new job growth. Uh, they are just, uh, you know, less access. Uh, and so less access to to uh, all sorts of things, even, even less access to government programs that would um, uh, allow... Uh, some kind of the policy to have as much effect here as it has here. Um, okay, and another piece of this uh, that, that comes into play, the policy is tilted towards households with their children. Uh, of course, this is uh, uh, you know, fair, fairly common in federal policy. You, you, it's April. I mean, maybe a lot of you aren't doing taxes and you certainly aren't Many of you taking dependent uh, exemptions, um, but when you when you have children, um, that sort of gets taken into account in all sorts of eligibility. It takes an account into your sort of uh, net income and for tax purposes, uh, but also for eligibility and food programs, food assistance programs, um, so that it is much easier to stay in the program and to continue to qualify if there are children of developmental age in the household because the nutrition and the and and failures in adequate nutrition are have their most severe consequences uh in in you know young people uh developing uh trying to develop yeah so so those 
Uh, so policies carve out uh, that, and so you see that there's actually, uh, if 8% uh, if we have sort of an 8% number of food insecure, uh, whether children in the household, you get a very tiny piece of that. All right? So we're, the policy is, is sort of adequately uh, keeping households with children from falling into the very low food security, the disruption. And you'll see how the sort of program structure, the variety of programs works to achieve that. And so that's what we do next. We go through this, the programs. The big one, uh, the big uh, effort is SNAP, or what used to be food stamps. Um, it's it's now paid through sort of electronic uh, benefit transfer cards. Uh, so it's basically you, you run like a debit card. You get an allocation for the month. Um, it limits what is eligible to be covered in your spending. And uh, yeah, this is data, I think, from the latest or from the 2018 CRS report, so that uh, spending had fallen to about 69 billion per year um, after you know five six years of economic growth and, and unemployment falling, uh, starting to really show up in the in the program. So 69 billion, uh, the per person average about 126 dollars. Okay, so uh, you can you can benchmark that I think that's the most useful thing is is what is the sort of uh, you know, the total spending is what it is uh, but but what we're interested in is sort of uh, how do we sort of think about that program benefit as a on a per person basis what does it cost someone to eat uh, most of us spend quite a bit more than $126 per person uh, for food um, you know just the uh, 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 you, you get a long way there you know, eating away from home uh, which my family does once a week uh, you know and so it, it's a little difficult to put in the, in like terms because most of us don't try to and uh, if you look in the chapter there's an interesting little section there on the food stamp challenge uh, that, that some Congress people have tried to do um, you know, and their staff to try to understand sort of the challenge of eating on $126 and only eating things that are eligible for, for EBT transfer payments. Um, you know, so, so that is the, the sort of average. Um, of course, if that's the average, it means there's quite a few that are, are much smaller benefits and some that are larger um, in that range, and we'll see the range as well. Uh, 69 billion covers 42 million people in 21 million households. Uh, if you're interested, about 44 percent of the, the the recipients or the sort of beneficiaries are under 18. 12 percent above 60 uh, above 60. Uh, of course, this is an important number because these are people that are likely to remain on the SNAP roll forever. Um, this is a number that we track to one understand how well benefits are, are reaching uh, developmental age uh, youth but also um, you know to see how households in food assistance status are responding are they having more or less children that sort of thing uh, and then nine percent disability status um, participants if you look through here you can read all of the sort of information uh, but the, the key one participants have to meet eligibility criteria at a household level. That means their gross cash income, the, the full intake, uh, has to be uh, take the poverty line for the U.S., which is there's no reason you would know exactly what that is, but it's basically um, a level of earning power that is consistent with sort of food, health, shelter, uh, and sort of other essentials right so the poverty line is basically what amount of money do you have to make to cover this sort of set of essentials um, and food assistance kicks into 130 percent above that okay and there are all kinds of reasons why it might move to 130 um, percent one we're just not good at, at estimating the poverty line um, there is of course any political person 
would like to have a low poverty line because it's never good if people in your congressional district or people in the country or your state uh, that you're presiding over have if you have a large percentage in poverty so poverty lines tend to be uh, sort of underestimated and the policy sort of makes up with it 130 uh, percent and then of course 130 percent here is the gross number and um, take the net off of that so there are these deductions that you're allowed to take just like you would take deductions uh, for just like you would take deductions for your federal income tax or your state income tax you take deductions and then you have to stay when you do those deductions 100 percent of the poverty line so you have to be at the poverty line in terms of your net cash income there's also an asset threshold so if you're sitting on uh, some additional wealth you're expected to draw that down before participating in the program um, okay at about 10 percent the size uh, this gets into this so this is the sort of general program for households the second the rest of these programs are really that that second piece targeted at households with children um, and, and trying to ensure that we do not end up with low food insecurity in in those type of households uh, and so we get the women infant children uh, program um, that's about 10 percent of the size 7.3 million individuals uh, and so 52% children, 24% infants, and of course 24% uh, uh, women. Uh, and these are beneficiaries that are allowed to, to purchase certain products um, that are sort of considered to be nutrient essentials uh, for these stages of life, right? So, uh, and automatic, um, automatic eligibility comes from being a SNAP beneficiary. So if you're in the SNAP program, this qualifies as an extra benefit, um, but also it catches more people. So if you aren't poor enough to participate in SNAP, right, if you're not that 130% gross income, 100% net income level, but instead 185% of the poverty level of income, you will be qualified for this assistance, right? And again, this is just, these percentages are here one because the poverty line uh, is is a crude measure and it's often an understated measure and it doesn't move quickly enough and so these percentages are there to really go after this this policy objective of making sure we minimize the sort of at-risk uh, youth population in terms of nutrient and, and food deficiency <coughs> um, Categorical eligibility, so if we look at this, basically says if you're in SNAP, WIC is an automatic qualifier for you. And that is something that is, is sort of common in welfare and low income assistance programs is this idea of categorical eligibility. To qualify for one program, we're not going to run your data, run your numbers again. The fact that you're receiving this other benefit means that we're going to accept you into that program. So. Um, a lot of what has happened in SNAP, especially when the economy is in turmoil, is to just adopt, to do a waiver on SNAP check, SNAP eligibility check on the income threshold, and just say this household is already qualifying for state rent assistance or living assistance. This household is already qualifying for, for some other benefit. Um, let's do let's just expand that eligibility over to SNAP and we'll see how long we need to do that because the goal when the economy is in crisis is to keep people sort of spending money and to keep people from falling into um, lower status, right? Uh, lower income status. Uh, so uh, that is what a lot has happened. So means testing. Means testing means <laughs> examining someone's ability to to meet uh, on the income side uh, spending levels but these can be bypassed uh, if you're meeting some other low income assistance criteria uh, a big one back 10 years ago was uh, there's energy uh, assistance funds for for certain households um, heating basically uh, especially in in the colder places in the country uh, those states all got waivers to automatically enroll those same people in SNAP. 
uh, basically looking to keep grocery, um, you know, grocery mo money coming into groceries through the groceries into to checks for people that work in groceries, just trying to keep sort of economic uh, activity going. And of course, a great way to do that is to put a lot of money in people's hands that will spend it immediately and um, you know on necessities that require people to be employed to deliver those necessities so when they talk about this uh, the stimulus bill the fourth phase or third phase whichever it is for the current crisis and sending people $1,200 checks they're sending everybody checks because they want people to spend those they're really hoping that nobody puts those in a savings account they want the uh, economic multipliers. They want people to spend that and to have that money turned over into revenue for stores and stores to pay people and that work there, but also to order more goods to fill the shelves and then to pay the people that work in processing and so forth. Um, so much of this growth in SNAP and the 2008 financial crisis came about because of categorical eligibility the lagging recovery, especially for the poorer households, the difficulty you know, in, in jobs that were considered sort of low skill meant that uh, states, as sort of an economic boost, and even the federal government, just pushed the boundary and said, let's just let more people be in SNAP. One, we know that more money means better nutrition in general for these households. Um, and it just means more flexibility, but also it means more spending to try to create more jobs. And so these are the sort of factors that were trying to be counteracted. Unemployment, job loss, uh, food security, of course, was the, the sort of target of the, the EBT spending. And then, of course, there was a, still a credit crisis going on. So even households that needed, that may have had some uh, uh, assets may not be liquid and may not be able to, to sort of do the, the credit side or the financial side adjustments that would let them maintain that. And then, of course, demand side stimulus, spending money uh, to, to move things ahead. Um, again, in that sort of low income, uh, low food insecurity targeting to try to make sure that none of, you know, as few Households with children fall into that low food insecurity. We have the school breakfast program, four billion a year, and school lunch program, fourteen billion a year. Um, again, these these are these are programs where the school uh, once you have a qualifying student, they get the funds directly, and it comes in and it covers the meal costs and or whatever the partial meal cost or the full meal cost. And a lot of places that are high food insecurity. Um, high food insecurity in the National School Lunch Program, you're allowed to just have a blanket free breakfast program. Any student that wants to come in and eat breakfast can, and that is if 40%, uh, and so this is these poverty clusters or these uh, food assistance clusters. So if you're in a place where it's just prevalent, uh, then they just, they just turn open the door and say, everybody comes in, there's a free breakfast here. Uh, and uh, it is again about this sort of idea that we do not want, uh, you know, it's not clear what always is going on in food assistance policy, but what is clear is households with children uh, are the priority and the programs bear that out. Um, okay, so the last thing here on the eligibility, so this is another sort of blanket eligibility. If you're just living in an area uh, that is, has high prevalence, you will have categorical eligibility in schools. Um, okay, so just tracking the numbers. So here are the people in the program. Here are the uh, dollar spendings in the program from 2006. And then the next slide goes ahead to 2017. And just wanted to look at the trend a little bit. So the individuals covered in the program, uh, this is, these are millions, or sorry, this is thousands. So 44,000 is, add another thousand and you get a million, right? So 44 million people, 46 million. Uh, between two, you know, 2008 and 2012, 18, right? So something like uh, 18 over 30, something like 60% increase, 60% uh, of this original number added to uh, the rolls here. And of course, you get the commensurate spending. 
uh, increase. Uh, actually, way more, right? Yeah, so 37 to 78. So you get a doubling or more than a doubling of spending. Um, okay, the program size. Um, I mostly want to be sure I cover this because I know it's in your quiz. Um, 2008, 28,223. 2010, 40,000. So this is, you know, sort of really when the effort starts going. 2010, we see that the economic recovery is lagging, categorical eligibility and sort of expansion. Uh, trying to get more households in the program just to try to boost the recovery from the demand side and also take care of some food insecurity goals happens. And so we push ahead. And you see that it doesn't even peak until 2013 in terms of both spending and the number of individuals. Uh, finally, this starts to take hold and we start seeing the reductions. And by 2017, back to the 2010 levels. That's definitely a quiz question, so pay attention to it. But that's been the trend, and since then, of course, we've been re reducing these. But why? I wasn't going to use this slide, but I wanted to leave it in because this is something we're going to see play out again. Um, you know, it, it, there's going to be emergency recovery payments, but also we're going to use existing structures like SNAP, going to be expanded on, and you're going to see this categorical eligibility jump uh, from whatever it is now, which is relatively high. I think 37 million uh, is the last number I know that's quoted, probably for 2018 or 2019. Um, but you know, it would not be surprising to see that number go 30% uh, higher. Uh, that's just how desperate this sort of uh, dip in the economy is going to be. Even if it is the sort of hoped for V-shaped dip, where uh, I think if you listen to the president of the White House talking about this is sort of artificial. We are shutting things down on our own. It's not because there's this structural problem where the economy just sort of crashed on its own. Things got shut down. Even if it's V-shaped, uh, the information we have says that among the poorest people, the recovery will take the longest, and so the benefit programs will probably match that up. Okay, this is hopefully the longest lecture. Uh, it's sort of an introduction to the programs, introduction to the data. Uh, from here on out, we'll be talking about things uh, a little more, uh, a little more briskly, I hope. And uh, got a couple more of these to go. So uh, move ahead and take your quiz on this one, and then keep going through the module.